The views and opinions expressed by the guests of Sasquatch Experience do not necessarily reflect the opinion of the host, sponsors, or affiliates of the Sasquatch Experience. As always, listener discretion is advised. 911, what are you reporting? Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Does a legend walk among us, lurking in the forests of our world? Did you see what it was? Was it a person or an animal? Or I can't tell. All I know is that my sensor light came on and I just happened to glimpse and see this thing running across the yard. A uh, good-sized man or something that looks like a man. I don't know what it was. For over 15 years, we've talked with scientists, researchers, investigators, and witnesses trying to gain insight and proof around the existence of this mysterious entity. Jesus Christ, you better... See ya! Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh Uh-oh. Okay, hang on. He's right... Is he in your yard, sir? Yeah, God, he's big. Okay, what's he doing in your yard? He's looking at me. Join us as we continue into the investigation of the Sasquatch experience. And good evening, everyone. Welcome to Valentine's Day, Monday, February 14th, 2022. And gentlemen, I love you. Oh, I have a heart on for all of you guys right here. You know, if you can see it. But yes, I do. Yo, yo, Henry, Henry, you need to back out. Yeah. You ain't getting the fifth out of this one. All right? oh, <laughs> and that's how we started here on the Sasquatch Experience, folks. Not only talking about big, hairy creatures, but uh, Henry May and our quest to find him the perfect lady. If you have any recommendations or suggestions besides Match.com or for him to just simply give up, email us Sasquatch Experience. No, don't do that. All right. He's Good evening, guys. Oh, yeah, that's definitely probably not his site. Good evening, guys. Good to see you this week. Yeah. I hope you all had no, a little bit of fun and love. Too. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's a great day. Feeling the love out there. Magic. Happy VD to everybody. Yeah. yeah I hope you all. <laughs> Those of you that were a willing participant in VD, congratulations. If not, I'm sure the clinics will be loaded up with penicillin tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Just tell him he needs a Charlie Sheen cocktail. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> there we have it. Ooh. Well, going to be a great show tonight, guys, as we continue season five. Brian, our executive producer, happy Valentine's Day to you, big guy. Our executive producer, Brian Corbin, there, always helping us behind the scenes with the direction of the show. And you, too, could become an executive producer for $10 a month, but we also. Can, you can support the show for as little as $2 a month. Go to patreon.com forward slash Sasquatch Experience for more. You get exclusive ad-free shows and a bunch of other stuff I have yet to send out, but it's coming. Bear with us. Guys, mm-hmm. great to be here this evening as we're getting to talk about <laughs> one of my inspirations in Bigfoot, Mr. John Green, legendary Sasquatch researcher, author, author, of the Sa- or the Sasquatch, Sasquatch, the Apes Among Us, um, probably the most important book that I've read on the subject, most important book to me, and of course other folks, their actual mileage may vary, but if you listen to any reputable investigator, any longtime researcher, anybody that puts lists together, they'll tell you that John Green's book is probably number one or number two uh, mm-hmm. on most lists out there. Yeah, or uh, mm-hmm. you know, preferred reading. It's number um, two on Daniel Perez's new list of top ten books, behind Ivan Sanderson's Abominable Snowman: Legend Come to Life. Yeah, and of course, sadly, neither men will be making books anymore. So uh, right. that's the that's the gold standard that those of us writing books or those who want to rise write a book. That's what you have to go up against, right? Some intense competition from John Willis and Green and Mr. Ivan T. Sanderson. 
Henry, when are you going to write your book? <laughs> we got to whoop, whoop back to Mike Feldman, yeah. our good Mike. buddy from uh, the Ohio Night Stalkers. And, of course, Les Sinkovich, our buddy Les. Hey, who, Les. Who uh, was part of the reason we came back to Sasquatch Experience. Does some great graphic work. Seek out Les Sinkovich out there. Our good buddy. Glad to see you there, Les, in the chat room. And, we'll, of course, as people log in, we'll say hello as we go. Mm. Uh, my Sasquatch journey started when I was nine years old because of Sasquatch the Apes Among Us. Uh, not this particular copy of the book. That's a nice picture. Not that particular copy, but it was more of, I think, a green kind of hardbound book that I had. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, that my father procured and I wouldn't shut up on a road trip and we know how I like to talk. Mm-hmm. And I read that book you the whole talk? vacation. What? No, no, not me. Not a talker <laughs> at all. Right. God. And no. it was enough to get me to shut up and it, you know, it really changed my life. And it, it's, I don't want people to think I became like a disciple of green, but the book was just, it made things real. For me, a Bigfoot wasn't just a Pacific Northwest creature at that point. He wrote chapter 14, Eastern Action, like really brought mm-hmm. it home that mm-hmm. these things are happening in Pennsylvania mm-hmm. and another state in other states across the country uh, in the East, uh, which mm-hmm. opened me to other authors and researchers along the East Coast. And, of course, led me to meet Henry May, led me to meet Eric Altman. And, of course, our lives were never the same after Henry and I. Uh, came together good or bad uh we can thank john green for, for at least in my respect for all this now henry you're probably the second most seasoned uh, how did it come about for you how did you first become familiar with john green well it was through uh i believe and i'm not if i'm not, if I'm not mistaken it was through the documentary the mysterious monsters there was a yeah. picture of him and then, and then they wrote about him in the book, The Mysterious Monsters. And he was a prominent researcher at that at that time. And of course, he was he was a newspaper man. This is a guy who ran Absolutely. a new, successful newspaper. Hmm. Then I finally got to read one of John Green's books, and I was just I was blown away by it. Was Sasquatch Shapes Among Us the first John Green book you read, or did you read one of the others? Oh, gosh. I believe so. Yeah. And that was he 2004. Because he had wrote other books on Bigfoot. Sasquatch Shapes Among Us was not his first book. No. Uh, on the Track mm-hmm. of Sasquatch was written in 1968, mm-hmm. and Year of the Sasquatch written in 1970, and The Sasquatch File written in 1973. So he had written three mm-hmm. books. Uh, before he wrote Sasquatch Stapes Among Us. Uh, mm-hmm. And then he wrote Encounters with Bigfoot and the Best of Sasquatch Bigfoot afterwards, which I think the Best of Sasquatch Bigfoot was like a reprint or a combine of a couple books with, I think, a little extra material maybe he put in. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, all good books, all out there. And you, if you can find them, uh, well worth it. Now, I I have a couple copies of Sasquatch Stapes Among Us and I have... The ebook because you always like to be able to take your books portably with you wherever you go. They finally did make it available in a Kindle version uh, on mm-hmm. Amazon for folks who'd like to go out and still support the uh, the work of John Green. It's, and keeping these materials out there for new investigators and researchers is just incredibly important. I can't emphasize enough the importance of picking up a book like that and diving in if you're really new to the field. Because mm-hmm. of you, it'll answer a lot of questions. I think that you'll have uh, going into this, uh, and especially a lot of the stuff that's retreaded out on forums, uh, on Reddit's. Like I've just started getting into the Reddit, so I don't know why I did that. Have a <laughs> but uh, you know, a lot of people ask questions. I had a guy that was you know emailing me two, three o'clock in the morning, messaging me on on Facebook. And I'm like, just pick up a damn book and I read the question. That. You remember this? Like, the question you want. You're not asking anything novel. Like this right. isn't new. This material's yeah. out there for you to pick up a damn book and read a little bit. And but they get uh, mad. Yeah, like, well, I had to read it. You know, you should read it too. And 
you know, first of all, you're taking my interpretation of the things that were written by somebody. Your actual mileage may vary from what you exactly. interpret from it, right? Like it's all subjective to how you comprehend and want to make these things real. Um, but John started in this field, like I don't want to say accidentally, Henry. He started in it because of some tongue-in-cheek articles he was putting in his newspaper. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And then after he started receiving more and more of these sightings, he's like, you know what? There's something to this. Mm -hmm. I ought to really start investigating. If you go to the Sasquatch archives, uh, Todd Prescott, good friend, uh, curates a lot of these videos. He's got a massive wealth of information that he's put together. And a couple Mm -hmm. of them are interviews with John Green. Now, Todd will tell you he doesn't feel like at the time. He, was, he had done some interviews with MMA fighters, but he hadn't done anything serious like interviewing another journalist. Mm-hmm. And uh, John, at that point in time, wasn't entirely oh. great at oh, creating a narrative. Train wreck, is it? Oh. No, I uh, had to mute bake. That train comes <laughs> through every Monday at that time. But he wasn't great at creating the narrative. And sadly, a lot of the... A lot of the interviews you see with John, even the one he did with us on Sasquatch Experience in his later years, Mm -hmm. it was an effort on John's part to really form an answer that was, you know, that had some substance to it, right? Not because Mm -hmm. I'm sure he he couldn't, but you've been talking about this for 60 years or or however long, and you got these guys answering the same questions. And I'm sure when you're on the other side of the table, it's a lot easier to Mm -hmm. ask the questions and it is sometimes to answer it. Like you're asking him to think back into the 1950s and sixties. Why did you do something? Hell James and I can't determine why we chose what we chose for breakfast today, let alone remembering why we did something. Mm -hmm. And you know, 19, 19, 1954. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, very true. So a lot of those interviews that we have are, you know, it, it portrays John, you know, as an elder statesman, I just like to put that out there for people because it does take him some time to recall. And sometimes his answers mm-hmm. are short, but that was, you know, you know yeah, what but, we were working with. But you got to also realize is, you know, and I learned this for many years of like working retail. When you sell the same item every day and someone asks you a question, a lot of times there's a percentage of your brain that goes, don't you know this? I do this every day, da, 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 you know? And I think a lot of these older researchers, even the present ones that have read all the books and things like that, a lot of times, like they don't take the question with a fresh attitude. They take a question of, this is the fifth person today that's asked me about this damn thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And, And like, they're trying to be polite, but still the back of their head is like, okay, all right, tree snaps. Do we got to do this today? You know, like, I'll give you a story if you don't mind. Um, I was eating, I was eating lunch with, who was it? Uh, Binder Knuckle or it was one of, we were at a OBC and it was one of the, it was um, one of the gentlemen and somebody just sits down next to us and starts talking about foot casts and, and mm-hmm. thermal ridges. I'm like, Guy's just trying to eat a burger. Why don't we wait for feet conversations? You know, when he's at his little... <laughs> right. You right. Know? You know, right. or the time that, like... And I don't like to throw names out, but, like, I'll, it's important to the story, is Josh Gates was just trying to order a sandwich, and they got these three people just asking 50 questions. I'm like, look, can you let Josh order his food, and then you can ask him 12 questions about, you know... His his show. I mean, he doesn't mind hell, you know, talking to you. But there's just a moment where you got to give him his space. Right. And secondly, I want to order a sandwich, and I can't do that until he's done. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't yeah. mess with Bake when he's hungry. Hangry. Oh, hell no. Yeah. Right. Um. You I know, there's hangry. <laughs> <laughs> there's a number of things though about John that or at least one prominent thing that I wanted to bring up is that he had very basic and substantial point of view that he always stood firm with. And one of the most profound things that I always find that, that John would say over and over and over, whether he wrote it or did it in interviews was the fact that it's something we all think about, but we don't say out loud. And John's opinion is it either 
it is or it isn't. And if it isn't, mm -hmm. then that is the bigger mystery of the fact that why through millennia have we been talking as humans about this creature? And that's yeah. a bigger exactly. story, but it either is or it isn't. And, you know, mm -hmm. and I, you know, my heart breaks for the fact that, you know, John did not have a visual encounter himself, but he was, in my opinion, very much a believer. Otherwise, of the fact he wouldn't be friends with Bob Gimlin and everybody else in the community, because he certainly mm -hmm. didn't do this for any kind of notoriety or monies. He never did. Take a look at John's home. You know, it, it's a middle American middle-class home that he lived in up until his elder years until he passed it wasn't that he was gaining all of this extra monetary value to his life and i always found that opinion you know and i know we brought it up on the show before it either it is or it isn't yeah and to the know, to the it, point he would make and he would write that that always resonated with me van since we're kind of on that topic is that if even if all these reports were proven to be a hoax, if one was proven to be right, right you know, it, yeah, it's all been worth it, thing. right? Right. I'm paraphrasing. It's not his exact quote, but no, no, no. Um, but that's exactly the motif just in which one, he painted. Right. That's right. If just one of those sightings is correct, and I guess mm -hmm. you know, not to take this into the vein of the Patterson film, but he's an incredibly important important proponent of that. Uh, ma mainly the after, not the filming of the of the footage, mm -hmm. but what happened after, right? Uh, you know, he invested a lot of time, energy, and money into it. Mm -hmm. uh, getting there, yeah. getting getting from British Columbia to that uh, part of California, Upper mm -hmm. California, at that point probably wasn't cheap, uh, mm -hmm. and and took a lot more time than it does today, right? And took oh, more sure. resource, absolutely. So for something that have happened, like I'm, I, I guess. Without trying to, you know, be over dramatic, I, the thing that hangs me up the most about it is you have guys like John Green, Grover Krantz, um, the Four Horsemen, Jeff, <laughs> Jeff Meldrum, Je yeah, that right. all believe that the creature in the Patterson film is a real creature, mm -hmm. and regardless if we want to agree on how large it is or how, you know, or, or you know the height or the weight or whatnot, but the fact is that they can all at least agree that this is a real creature. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen that are far smarter than I am, and probably far smarter than most of the skeptics. Like that's that's so telling to me, and I don't base the Patterson Gimlin film. It's not the foundation of my belief in Bigfoot by any means, but it's important to the evidence and it's important to the history. Mm -hmm. And it was important enough for John Green to contribute so much to the story and legacy of the Patterson film. Right. Uh, that's that's right. very telling to me that it, there has to be something more to it than a man in a suit. And I would have to believe that with John's credentials as a newspaper man and an, an investigator, right by nature as a reporter, he would have at some point stumbled upon that answer. Mm-hmm. That if it was mm -hmm. a hoax, it was done by this person. This is exactly how it was done. And there was right. a reason he didn't believe Bob Hieronymus. Mm -hmm. There was a reason mm -hmm. why he never believed that it was John Chambers or anybody else that, uh, you know, had been involved in the, you know, perpetration. John didn't make any money off the Patterson Gimlin film. No. Mm -mm. Like no, you said, no. he didn't make a lot of money. Aside from selling his newspaper, he probably didn't make a lot of money off the Bigfoot. Even no. though he might mm -hmm. have one of the best-selling Bigfoot books of all time, that's a niche right. market, right? right? It's not like exactly. <laughs> New York no, Times bestseller right. John Oprah Green. Wasn't, yeah, yeah Oprah wasn't, wasn't giving Oprah. out copies, yeah. right? Like it right. wasn't a book club read. You get a book. You get a no. book. You and I guess that's book. why John Green strikes so strike so hard with me and why I, I guess gravitate to him as if, you know, I think everybody kind of pulls their, uh, I don't want to say hitches their, you know, hitches to the wagon, but like if you have veins of researchers that you respect and you follow a methodology or a, or a style, why I connect the green. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I feel like I have a lot in common with him from perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, <laughs> Excuse me. You're right. Damn. Yeah, yeah, I'm, die on us. I'm good. Um, 
No, because I was going to say something, and then I was <laughs> like, oh, choke on your words, fans. Um, and, of course, Green also came across his own evidence in, in tracks. Yeah. And mm-hmm. he, he looked at it in a very analytical way where a lot of people would have come across the tracks and said, oh, it's a Bigfoot. Oh, let's cast it. It's definitely Bigfoot. He did take a look at it in a very analytical way and then presented his evidence as to what he came across. And, you know, it's fascinating. And he talks a lot about, in his books and in in interviews, about the tracks and the variations and what it would have actually taken. And I think we've all probably... Uh, come up with the same conclusion some of the insane amount of work that it would take in order to create some of the hoaxes in which even he came across but you know other people that have come across trackways uh, it's just you know he shrugs his shoulders and says "I i just don't see how that could possibly be a hoax exactly and that's uh, again you go back to telling right mm-hmm. H- how how does that I just don't understand how there's so much doubt uh, to certain aspects of this field still to this day when it convinces some of the best that we've had that mm-hmm. this creature is real. Right? Yeah. And then, look, we all struggle with it even now. Like we all have our questions as to, I don't think I struggle as much as the existence, the existence of Bigfoot as I struggle with most of the evidence and stories and sightings that are put out there. How about I think it? A, That's a I good think point. A, yeah, and I, I think to my point now, I'm I'm convinced, at least from beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the Bigfoot Sasquatch is a real, living, breathing creature, mm-hmm. whatever it may be. Yet is another story, and we all have different, you know, concepts on what that is. Right. But what still strikes me is so much of this garbage that's put out there and perpetuated, uh and is just out there unknowing and and it's just constantly churned and churned and churned is presented as someone's proof and someone's evidence. It's sickening and sad because it doesn't play any homage to what folks like John Green, uh, Grover Krantz, you know, Cliff Barrick, but it doesn't pay any tribute to the work they've done and put into it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And Mm -hmm. that might be why is to, you know, Mm kind of knock them down a few pegs on the ladder. I, I don't know. I really yeah, don't know why, but, you know, go ahead. But, I mean, what do they really win? And this is where I always have this conversation is, is like, it's a small group. It's a reasonably small group, except for people, like even people on the outside, like they know high end names. And even if you sit there and go, okay, well, I made sure John Green didn't understand what he was doing and. And I, I understand that Meldrum's a fake and blah, blah, blah. Like, I, there was a guy the other day that just kept going through names and saying, I knew this guy and I know that he was lying and da, da, da. And I'm like, why are you wasting that much time on something you clearly hate or you clearly whatever? You're not getting anything out of this. Eventually, mm-hmm. you're just making yourself worse, you know. And the worst part is eventually people are either going to believe you completely and then stop listening because they're like, oh, yeah, he's right. So therefore, we'll stop dealing with Bigfoot or they're going to go. He's an ass. Let's just stop <laughs> listening to him. Well, I, I think that's that's a good point. But you also you, you, that venom that that person's spitting out. And I don't know who that person is. We, we must have missed on that communication train. But. I'll have to you know, you. these people that are have probably not been believed by some mm-hmm. of the big name researchers. A lot of the besmirching I see of a lot of the, I guess we'll call them our upper, upper echelon or even some of the contemporaries we work with, a lot of the uh, vitriol that gets spit their way is because they reported something to them that they didn't believe. Mm-hmm. Or you they, know, or, and now yeah. because you don't believe me and you don't give me any credit, I'm going to go out of my way to discredit you, pal. And that's where some I think some of the hoaxing comes from, too. And I'm sure Green and them dealt with that back in the day. And you and Henry will bring you in on this. Because you can't talk about John Green without talking about some of the other mm-hmm. researchers of the t- hiccup. Sorry, researchers of the time. Yeah, Renee right. DeHinden. Mm-hmm. Uh, who started out working with John Green. Mm-hmm. And then what happened? 
Well, they had a falling out. Yeah. And Thomas Steenberg explained it, exp- explained it this way. He said that jo- Renee had been left out in the heat of the Northern California sun all day and apparently got pissed at John Green and said, don't you ever do that to me again or I'll shoot you oh. <laughs> or something like that. Wow. <laughs> Gun violence. Yay. So, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. It's existed before now, so that just it's not a cultural thing, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's not a cultural. So that that whole thing broke down because of uh, he left them out and uh, left them out in the heat too long. That could piss people off. I could get that. <laughs> I could I could definitely see that being a uh, a problem. Know, or all your friends went on a hayride and left you at a Nickelback cover band. <laughs> You're allergic to hay, okay? That was like four years ago. Uh, wow, that just came out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> you drive with a friend, it almost kills you at a red light. Yeah. Oh, Corey, dear. our good friend Corey in the chat room. So great to see you, buddy. Hey. Thanks for coming in and spending some time with us. Our man Corey, our love out to you, brother, of course. Hey, Corey. Got to get him back on the show. Still our highest rated episode of Sasquatch Experience. How about that, Corey? Our yeah. highest rated show. Our highest rated show. Because he's f- feckin' entertaining. <laughs> he really is. Got to right. catch myself. I left yeah. one F word slip last week, and I've heard about it enough. I'm sorry. Okay. I swore. Oh. All right. Nice. Anyhow. Way to anyhow, go, Sean. It got us an explicit rating again. <sighs> oh, well. Anyhow, back to the important things, John Green. You brought so, us an explicit rating? So, oh. Shut up, James. Okay. <laughs> so, John, so John and Renee have a falling out, and they stop working together altogether after that. Mm-hmm. And then become kind of rivals. I guess maybe not so much. I don't know. Because if you look at that, if you look at Renee in videos from like the 90s, and like he's a very antagonistic Mm-hmm. character which i really like he's like um uh like james baker may be reincarnation of renee dandon in some way <laughs> shape or form with the amount of trolling and antagonizing that happens uh i uh, react to the given stimuli so did uh-huh. he and if you watch a lot of the videos renee pops off when mm-hmm. he when he is offended by something somebody says, and sometimes right. it's it's quite the outburst. Right. You guys got to check out. You got to go check out Todd Prescott's channel, the uh-huh. Sasquatch Archives, because it you'll spend a whole day there. You really yeah. will. Yeah. And the things you'll you'll see and you'll hear will will just blow your mind. It's <laughs> it's great stuff. And I'm like, uh, they yeah. they fight worse than we do now. We just have a bigger platform for it. <laughs> right, right. But you have to. Uh, you know, get into the, you know, the time frame. We got to wrap up this thought, then we'll take our news uh, real quick, which you folks will love this week. Um, news. You know, that little souring of the milk between Renee and John Green has long lasting repercussions. How much mm-hmm. more could they have got done if they continued to work together? Maybe we'll talk about that right after the break, folks. Oh, oh, Stick we around. Will. Sasquatch Experience, Sean Forker, James Baker, Vance Nesbitt, Henry May. We'll catch you on the flip side. This weekend only, it's the Hills and Streams Sasquatch Experience Supercenter Grand Opening Sale. Our newest location located 12 feet off Rural Road 666. See our extensive thorn and thicket selections and untraversed mud trails. Huge savings on many select Salvation Army camping gear. Up to 25% off real bow and arrow sets for toddlers with real laser sights. And 50% off single pebble in the hiking boot. Not annoying enough? March around our Find the Gopher Hole Arena and sprain an ankle. First 75 visitors will receive a free stick. But wait, there's more. Enter to win our on-site drawing to win big on Find the Rabid Badger Tour with all-inclusive first aid kit. Locate the abandoned cars in our parking lot of visitors who have not returned. So come out this weekend to the Hills and Stream Sasquatch Experience Supercenter Grand Opening Sale. Located 12 feet off Rural Road 666. All right, for all of you that have left to go into the bathroom, you're going to miss out. 
I don't know what this story has to do with John Green, other than the fact that, well, they're both green, I guess. Out of Palu, Indonesia, a wild crocodile with a used motorcycle tire stuck around its neck for six years has finally been freed by an Indonesian bird catcher in a tireless effort. There's a bad dad joke. Uh, According to wildlife conservation officials, they hailed as a milestone this past Wednesday. The 14.8-foot saltwater female crocodile has been an icon to the people in Palu. The beast was seen on the city's river with a tire around its neck becoming increasingly tighter, running the risk of choking her. Well, first off, she's getting bigger, the tire is not getting tighter unless it happens to be a Harley boa constrictor another bad dad joke I apologize conservation officials were racing to rescue the crocodiles since residents spotted the reptile in 2016 generating sympathy among residents and worldwide I don't remember hearing about this story until now so how it's worldwide I'm not sure In 2020, Australian crocodile wrangler Matthew Wright, an American wildlife biologist, Forrest Gallante, tried and failed to free the reptile. In early January of this year, -year 35-year-old bird catcher and trader, 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 Tilly, who was recently moved to the city, heard about the famous crocodile from his neighbors and was determined to rescue the reptile after he saw her frequently sunbathing. Yes, is it wrong for a man to stare at another animal sunbathing? I think not. Tilly is quoted as saying, I have experiences and skills. Okay, Liam Neeson. In catching animals, not only birds, but farm animals like chickens, probably, and release them from the cage. Tilly, who goes by a single name, told the Associated Press, I believe I can rescue the crocodile with my skills. He stringed ropes of various sizes into a trap tied to a tree near the river and laid chickens, ducks, and birds as bait. Probably all the birds that he rescued. What a dick. After three weeks of waiting and several failed attempts, the crocodile finally fell into my trap Monday night. With the help of two of his friends, Tilly pulled the trap crocodile ashore and sawed through the tire, which was 1.6 feet in diameter. Other residents then contacted firefighters and wildlife conservation agency to help them release the animal back into the wild. Okay. For all the efforts Tilly has done for protected wildlife, except for all the birds that he saved that he used as bait, being kind of an animal lover he is, and that's a great milestone. Uh, It's unclear on how a used motorcycle tire got stuck around the crocodile neck. Conservationists have said that it was likely deliberately placed by people in a failed attempt to trap it as a pet or its skin for sale. But crocodiles and other swimming reptiles often travel into garbage-strewn waters with nothing to stop the tire from encircling them (laughs) again. Now we're making out the tire to be a predator. (laughs) Let me read that again. See, there was nothing to stop a tire from encircling them. Damn you, motorcycle tires. All in all, our... uh, Big female saltwater crocodile is now swimming free again to attack another day. Thanks again for listening to this edition of the Sasquatch Experience, Stranger Than Fiction News and Stories, and getting back to our conversation about the infamous John Green. Wow. <laughs> I'm I'm so glad you didn't continue to do that one article in... Australia. <laughs> what are you talking about, mate? I, I have no idea, but thank uh-huh. God, uh, our God. news, our news segments are getting more and more entertaining each and every week, thanks to the uh, talent of one Mister Vance Nesbitt. <laughs> wow, gracias. 
I'm I'm uh-huh. getting out of retail though. I don't know about opening that Sasquatch Experience Superstore. I think. <laughs> I think I'm. I think, I, I think I'll be a it. bystander on that. I, I, I the gopher hole, uh, <laughs> landmine finding. That's like uh, Monday mornings with me and Bake out there. So at the, we could. <laughs> so uh, we could open up our own store. We could be like, see the big hairy thing. Five bucks must be eighteen. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just the look on your face, Fork. <laughs> look at Fork. Top. It's always got to go there, doesn't it? Always got to go there. Anyhow, I'm talking to you. Be- okay. At least good. he threw the disclaimer out. That's all I care about. Keep it legal, okay. here, folks. Right. No R. Kelly today. No, God. It just keeps getting worse. Anyhow, so as we before we took our, our uh, news break, we talked about the falling out between. John Green and Renee DeHinden, uh, and kind of like all the work that was missed, but they weren't the only ones that had a falling out, Henry. No, um, John Green and Peter Byrne never yeah. got along. Never. Mm-hmm. Not ever. And why was never. that, Henry? Well, John Green felt that Peter Byrne was a fraud and that he mm. was only in it for the money. Did, and did look Peter at Byrne all the money, money that Green. Yeah, <laughs> is crazy. Burn. Well, how much money did he make off of it? Do you think that all came from the uh, Tom Slick stuff that you know Peter was able to pull funds from Tom and able to fundraise a little bit to get that work done out in the PNW because he was able to run the Sasquatch hotline and other things. I think so. Yeah. Because John amassed a great database himself. It was on index cards for the longest time, but it's then it got computerized. Over 3,000 sightings that, that John had, and somebody put it into a Microsoft Access uh, database. Pardon me. You could have been able, you could have accessed up until recently. Huh. It was on SasquatchDatabase.com, and you had to really know how to use Access to pull the data from it. It wasn't exactly user-friendly to everybody, but the fact is the data was there. Mm-hmm. And it was retrieved from his thousands of index cards that he saved all the information on. So, and there right. you go again. I guess another reason why that you know John was important is because of that. Over three thousand sightings would probably make that, uh, maybe more than the BFRO. I don't mm-hmm. know. I don't know how many collective hey, sightings are in the BFRO database. Right, but take a look at the comment that Corey made. John Green's books, Apes Among Us as information of where my encounters were in Manitoba. Manitoba. Mm-hmm. You know, that says yeah. a lot right there. Yeah. Well, I think Corey, like others, and I don't know Corey intentionally, but where we went in Clearfield f- for our experience, you know, we had gone there knowing it was an area of activity, right? right. Uh, I don't know if Corey had that same experience or not, that he went to that area knowing it was going to happen. I don't believe he did. I think he just kind of had the encounters. But the happenstance, right? Yeah, the happen. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you, Vance. Mm-hmm. Uh, and but John's that research wasn't exactly public to everybody either, though. All right. Before it became put on the internet as the database, like you had to go to John's and get through the information. Peter Byrne was running a hotline. Collecting mm-hmm. Bigfoot sightings. So it was almost mm-hmm. like they were competitors in a way, too, uh, for that mm-hmm. information. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if he didn't like him, for whatever reason, I'm pretty sure there was some contention there that was drawn even more. Did they appear at any kind of events at the same time after they, you know? There was only one time that they were in the same place, and that was yeah. the... Anthropology of the Unknown Conference in 1978. Because it's funny because I'm watching a lot of that stuff from Todd and like the Harrison Days, uh, Harrison Hot Spring Days symposiums, and Mm -hmm. they're not they're not together. You don't very Mm -hmm. rarely do you see a lot of them together. Now you you'll see Renee and John at some of the same events and Grover Krantz, but you won't see like Peter Byrne there. No, with them. And that was always kind of funny. Like, did they avoid each other on purpose going to the, like, what's your, you know, who lined up their calendars to make sure they didn't get there? Or did researchers at the time know they didn't get along? So instead of trying to jeopardize it, did they just yeah, right. make sure none of those things synced up? Right. Mm-hmm. right. And again, I we thought we were bad today. 
I think that's what it was. They wanted to make mm-hmm. sure that they didn't that there wasn't any meeting of the minds, as it were. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, you know, what's interesting is that of all the four of us on screen and me being such a John Green fan, only one of us have spent any time with John Green. Yeah. In person. Yo. Henry. Yo. Yeah. It's Henry May. Right. He he was a very, he was very friendly. He was a very good guy. He, he was, mm-hmm. you know, he, he, I posed for a picture with him in 2011. Yeah. At the I'm John jealous. Green tribute. Didn't get to make that trip, and I really wanted to. And uh, after interviewing John, I never got to meet him in person, which is probably my largest regret in Sasquatch this whole time I've spent is not getting to meet and talk to John Green in person. And there were several times I had the opportunity. I never took advantage of any of them. And I feel really, really bad about it because I am such a big John Green fan. But Henry's Henry's always made me jealous with that. It's always <laughs> always pissed me off that Henry got to hang out with John Green. But who better, though? Because I think, in a way, Henry's knowledge and Henry's way of preserving, whether it was through his Southeast Sasquatch Association blog or, or whatnot, Henry, you've always kind of kept that spirit alive, right, with the knowledge and it's like that recall memory you have, that a lot of it is from people like John Green and, and yeah. so forth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Henry you know, kind of keeps it alive. Yeah. Thank you, Henry. Yeah, You're right. Welcome. No, I've seen the pictures that you've posted of uh, of you and Mr. Green. I will it's refer to him as Mr. Green. You know, I I brought up earlier before the break about a couple of uh, Adam and things that John has always stuck to, and mm-hmm. another thing that I find fascinating that some of us think about and it is a big debating point um john always felt nope this is an animal it needs to be shot and brought in Mm -hmm. and others feel "Eh, i don't know it's too humanistic like and maybe not take that shot but john was very adamant about the fact of we need to bring one in shoot it If, if a hunter sees it shoot it bring it in let's take a look at it now there's been a lot of controversy over that just for the mere fact that perhaps maybe these creatures don't just travel solo there may be others in the area and there might be ramifications right there might be ramifications if you do shoot one uh retaliatory or whatever and i can't say that i blame that for happening if it is you know in a family unit of some sort but john was very uh adamant about the fact of you need to shoot one so and it, it is Grover, a big debate in the community. So was Grover Krantz. Grover Krantz yeah, was Grover very Krantz adamant. Was too, yeah. right. Yes, yes, he was. Absolutely. Henry, why do you think John was so adamant about that stance? What do you think made it made it that personal? And I don't want to say personal because like John wanted to go out and bag one. But what do you think made him take that stance? You think it was the years of not being able to prove it? That could be it. Yeah. That, Do you have any- that, that, you know. I th- I, th- I think that's what it is. He was just probably a lot of frustration on John's part. Yeah. Cuz you know, think about it, you spend all that time going to uh and researching it, not having anything to physically show for it. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that puts a little you know, I don't want to say desperation, but it puts a little fire to you know bring in a body and it's yeah. the one thing we're still lacking to this day is still no evidence and mm-hmm. we're how many years past john's death now almost 10 years past john passing away mm-hmm. and Nearly we still have six years him. is it six six years six okay. mm-hmm. passed away yeah. in 2016 right we uh you know haven't still haven't achieved that objective yet but, you know, again, though, Vance, a lot of people counter that, too. And, and a lot of folks that used to be in the It's an Ape camp have transcended to the It's a Hominid. It's a man-like creature. You know what I mean? Right. It's not just a, it's right. not an ape. And I I don't know where I stand on it anymore myself. Because I, know. The more you, I know. The more you read, like, part of me is very comfortable saying it is a. It could be. Uh, an yeah. ape. Like, it's a relic. Yeah. 
relic ape, right? But part of me is like, damn, this thing has some intelligence and it is evading us, actively right. evading us. Right. And is it learning us? And, I, and, and that's the other part, piece of this that maybe we're not thinking about is that uh, is there like, is this thing evolving and learning us as we're trying to learn it? And is it just a little smarter uh, than us as it's more adept to its environment? Is it using its knowledge and experience to counteract what we're trying to do? Right. right. Um, who was it? Um, Miss Irwin posted a, a art rendering. Steve Irwin? Uh, no, uh, Sibylla. Okay. Sibylla, thank you. Uh, she posted an art rendering maybe two weeks ago of a Sasquatch. And it's that's one rendering that I looked at that is that would take you back and say, no, I can't squeeze the trigger on that. Because the facial features look so Native American. And I find that interesting. I, f I find that whole concept really interesting that it looks so Native American. But and then and again, but let it right then again, as I always say, how much of that is our own bias being emptied into it? Yeah. Like, I think people have this tenacity uh, to humanize things, make them more human like because it's comfortable. Yeah. I don't know about you. I, I don't know personally if thinking Sasquatch is more of an ape than a man makes that any more comfortable. The fact that there's a weird guy out there that's absconding, uh, Not me. you know, technology or absconding, all that other evading people wanting to live on its own, massive, hairy, uh, you know, can beat your livestock, kill your horses and chooses to live that lifestyle as opposed to an ape that's doing it. A person doing it's a little scarier to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. But I just, I, I don't know. Like, part of me is, I, I guess I was I was talking with Heather uh, today from uh, The Lore You Know, and I'm changing and evolving in my research, too, right? As we go through this and we do, um, oh, there it is. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah, see, that looks that looks like the guy that used to do the Ernest movies. Uh, mm -hmm. What was his mm -hmm. name? He was famous. He was famous for being a Native American actor, but it turns out he was never really Native American. What was his <laughs> name? You know who Ricardo I'm talking Monobon? about? What? Yeah, no. Ricardo Monobon? No, it wasn't Ricardo. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't no, Con. No. Con! Con! Yeah, it wasn't well, Con. You know, the problem is, is they try to humanize things. Like, I, I like... It makes it easier for you to process it. That's why they always say is when they make a robot, they want to make it with two arms and two legs, and they want to mm -hmm. make it whatever. So that way mm -hmm. then you'll accept it in the household. Um, you know, and I think that a lot of times when they want to humanize it, that they forget that if it's supposed to be a creature that we're not sure on or a creature or whatever, making it too human makes it almost to a point where like you don't believe it because it's like oh my god that looks like an earl that lives up the street you know mm -hmm. that can't be possible <laughs> you know right right but it could be possible for the fact that one hasn't been shot or at least brought in for evidence purposes we don't know, don't know. right yeah we don't well know. what happened to the one we that was know. shot in the they turned it into a steak and gave it to Melba Ketchum, yeah. you know, like, yeah. where'd that no, lead us? Mm -hmm. And there's been a number of them that have been claimed to be shot and left. And, and I just hate to be so know. cynical about it, but that's the reality of where we're at. Mm -hmm. But the thing with the shooting and the killing of the the thing is, is like, my problem with it is, is why not, hey, I killed a Bigfoot and I drug it home. It's dead. Look, give me a billion dollars because the inquirer is going to give me a whatever for it. And I can guarantee Maybe. you that right. if I put out enough pictures, you know, the Georgia boys proved it. Somebody going to bite. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the fact is, is that if you have a legitimate claim, that thing is going to be like the Shroud of Turin. Okay. There will be people lined up in your yard. There will be people like, if you build it, they will come, you know, like, 
everything will just domino in. So why would you hide a body unless there's some other reason, like there's 50 other of them around that are kind of pissed right. you took their bob. You know? And right, let me right. tell you why post-Georgia hoax, being the first one to bag a Bigfoot's going to be no bueno. Yeah. Because the moment it's proven to be human, you're in a shit ton of hot water. Yep, mm-hmm. yep, yep. It doesn't matter if your intent or not, you killed another, at that point, be considered human. If it is human. I'm just going with that argument, Right. right? I honestly have been really thinking about that, and I was lying in bed the other night with that same exact thought that Process James was. Like, you know, you could sell it to the highest bidder, and then the next day end up in handcuffs because you committed Mm -hmm. a murder. Right. And, uh... You get a good lawyer. I'm sure it could help. But see, this show is about John Green, and John Green felt felt very strongly this is an animal. He did. And Mm -hmm. and And we should be shooting animals to discover what they are. But he felt extremely strongly about the fact that this is an animal and has nothing to share with any human species whatsoever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think old thinking... Uh, not old thinking, but that was the way science was when he mm-hmm. was, you know, forming his opinion. I don't know if that's mm-hmm. necessary anymore. I really don't. And unless science changes how they, uh, you know, categorize species and take specimen and prove their existence, right. that may be the case. Right. I just don't know if it's necessary anymore. But because there are so many hoaxes and and, and what have you out there now, it may be the only concrete way to put the nail in the coffin for the subject once and for all. Mm-hmm. But then again, once you that kill cost. one, <laughs> now you open yeah. up a whole nother category. Now we've proven right. it. And then guys like yeah. Vance Nesbitt, Henry May, Sean Forker, James Baker, Corey Luckapoy, we're all out and mm-hmm. the scientists are in. Then you're mm-hmm. going to need a permit for this and a license for this, yeah. and you're going to need academic credentials for this because we're mm-hmm. all gone, boys and girls. Real science yeah. comes in and does the job that we've been doing for them for 60 right. years because that's right. just how it goes. I'm not 100% on that because I, I really feel that when that came down, there's a lot of us on the high end that would be like, no, we want this guy because Forker's written all these books and he's he understands the concept. It's kind of like when you watch... Um, the movie I can think of is Evolution. The government <laughs> tried to the government tried to come in, but it wound up the two scientists who found the rock were the most useful. You know, mm-hmm. I just don't see mm-hmm. that, especially when you look at the field of people you have to choose from. You mm-hmm. might keep a a cliff. You might keep a you might keep a meldrum. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't see many other people sticking around on that for the you know yeah. qualified. Yeah, that's a good no, point. I'm just being honest. Yeah, that's like no, no. Just, and I agree just how with I you, feel. Sean. Yeah, I agree. That happens agree. a lot in in this stuff, right? And as we go to John, uh, and, and I don't think you can say anybody's right or wrong in the kill or no kill because kill it's an emotional thing, right? Yeah, you, you say what you want to at the end of the day. You want to take it for science, but it's an emotional reaction. Not uh, to the action in question. Mm-hmm. And like that boils down to the researcher. I don't know if I could pull the trigger if one was in front of me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Here you go. If you bring one in, you have to be prepared for the Karens <laughs> of, of the, the world. One hundred percent accurate. Yeah. James Baker. Situational. Situational. You know, if if you know a lot of these sightings and a lot of these things where they're throwing rocks at your cabin and shaking a door and you shoot one, and whether it's a human or it's a beast, basically they were trespassing on your yard and trying to terrorize you. So mm-hmm. you know, depending on where right. you live, has different laws on that too. So yeah, no, that's true. But going back to your Texas. point, going back to your point, Sean. You know, I think that John felt that the clock was ticking. And, you know, as he's getting older in years, it, I think he became more and more uh, entrenched in the whole idea of shoot one. I think he wanted to know before he passed on, you know, that, that this creature. And, and I felt that, the you know, the 
the time clock was already depressed and it's clicking and and he wanted an answer for himself personally and i don't blame him i we but all I guess... want an answer for ourselves too but we're not heavily invested the way john was mm-hmm. i guess my my question to that would be at what point was he a pro kale proponent like mm-hmm. when did that become a thing and i guess my my bigger question to that is when did the no kill pro kill conflict happen like at Mm. what point did that start you know yeah and i kind of noticed it probably it seems like a couple of years but i'm probably going to look at it realistically maybe within the last 10 years that i think further than that really started to yeah it probably goes further back than that but when it really fused and started to uh, gain some traction uh, uh, Mm -hmm. within the community itself anyway I don't know. I've gone back and forth on both sides of it. I've flip flopped myself on it. Like part of me to prove it exists really would just like someone to bag one. But the other part mm-hmm. of me is like, man, like, I don't know. I, I don't know if I could it do that. History. And, but, but does it? Cause you know, everybody's like, it's an endangered species. We don't know that. We really no, don't we know don't. that it's yeah. an endangered species well, We don't know what the population is. It right. exactly. could be according, popu- according, <clears throat> according, to ahead, Krantz, according to Krantz, it was not an endangered species. Yeah. It, no. would, be just like, mm-hmm. it would be just like killing a unicorn or a leprechaun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but right? I guess the point is with that, it might be population perfect for its species. You know, like yeah. it may right. have just enough to carry it going. Yeah. Uh, we could go uh, hours on this, and we just scratched the surface of John, like right, like nine. How many Sasquatch were on Noah's Ark? Hmm, two. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, that's another topic. I, I another think topic. one thing we should talk. We should, we <laughs> I didn't mean to go down there. I, I did. Go ahead, Henry. I just. I think one thing we should touch on is John Green's contribution of his theory about twenty inches of rain that Sasquatch are seen more. Frequently, where there's 20 inches or more of rain per year in an area. Yeah, and there were some interesting charts associated with that, too, that are out there. Maybe if I can find them, I'll put them up in the Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Somebody had done that uh, because it's an interesting perspective. Uh, Mm -hmm. And there's a whole we could really get into that, but I don't think we have the time. So we'll can that for another topic, Henry. Another John Green show, because I want to finish. I'm going to finish the show with John Green's words, and then Henry will take us home. Folks, check us out, SasquatchExperience.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, at Sasquatch Experience, Squatch EXP. In summary, I hope that I have been able to convey adequately the main points of a rather simple message. There is evidence that another erect primate shares this globe with mankind. The evidence may not be conclusive, but it is certainly ample to establish that the matter should be further investigated. In the meantime, the person who finds himself in a position to obtain a specimen should do so. In the knowledge that is important and that such creatures are neither rare nor human. Finally, don't worry about them. They are big, but they are nothing to be afraid of. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Final lines of... Sasquatch, the apes among us. Henry, take us home. Y'all be good or be good at it. Good night, everybody. Bye.